As you're turning to chapter one, I want to ask you a question. How would you feel today if upon waking this morning you got a phone call from Bill Gates who informed you that you are a distant relative of his and you are in his will? Would that excite you? Would it put things in perspective to know that you are possibly heir to millions of dollars that you didn't know about? That's what we're going to talk about in this service this morning. Because the reality is, folks, you and I are heirs to a huge fortune. The Bible is clear about what awaits the righteous when the Lord returns. And it is clear about it, not just so it would be some far-off dream that we have, some airy thing out there, but that it might affect the way we live now. That it would affect the way we think about life on this earth. I like what one brother said about giving. He said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And the reality and knowledge that you have been given a inheritance far beyond, to use the adjectives of Peter in his first letter, imperishable, unfading, incorruptible. So even if you struggle in this life for the rest of your life, having enough to get by on, you will know that there awaits you one day, riches that are so unfathomable that when the Bible describes this, it's difficult to wrap your head around it. So we're in Ephesians 1. We are in a series marching through the book of Ephesians called The Blessed Life. This is the fourth message, and I want to read verses. I really struggled with these verses, to be honest with you this morning. I didn't struggle with teaching them. It, I struggled with what to wrap my arms around in one message. It's too full a passage to do in just one message, but that's all I have time for, so I hope I've chosen wisely. Stand with me as we read God's Word in Ephesians 1, 11, through verses 14. If you don't have a Bible, the words are on our screen. In Him, verse 11, in Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, notice in verse 11, in him we, and now you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And I pray, Father, that our hearing this morning and my speaking would be to the praise of your glory. Lord, we have one request this morning, light, light, more light. Illuminate our hearts and our minds. Let us be so transfixed this morning on the inheritance that it affects us in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated, thank you. I have a confession. For a long time, I've wanted to change the name of the book of Acts. No one in church history has asked me to do it, but I don't like the title, the book of Acts. I would have named it this, the Acts of the Risen Lord through his new body, the church. I think that's a better title, because when Luke begins Acts, he says, of all that Jesus began to do and teach, and now he plunges into a description of what Jesus is continuing to do and teach through his body, the church. But in the book of Acts, my favorite story of the whole book of Acts is the story of how the gospel first came to the Gentiles. 
And you should have a vested interest in this if you're not a Jew, because this is how you got into this place to begin with. You weren't supposed to be here initially. Well, you were, but we Jewish people didn't find out about it till later. The story is Peter and the other apostles, despite everything Jesus taught them, still didn't get that this good news of a Jewish Messiah was going to go to non-Jews. They couldn't get that. Now, I'm sympathetic of these guys. I understand that. You know, I resisted the gospel for a year and a half when my brother was converted. And I didn't only resist because I didn't want to surrender my sinful life at that time. Someone asked me, do you believe that people can resist the gospel? I said, yes, absolutely, until God says you're not going to resist anymore. And I resisted, but a part of the reason I resisted, I'm being honest, is I thought if I come to Jesus, he'll make a Gentile out of me. And I'm being honest, because to a Jew, uh, Christianity was totally foreign. It's for Gentiles. I didn't even grow up in a very religious home, but I grew up instilled in me that Christianity is for Gentiles. And if you believe in Jesus, you become a Gentile. I fell off my seat when they gave me a Bible. A guy that had picked me up on the side of the road in Maryland gave me a New Testament, and I opened it for the first time at 17 years old, never held it in my hands, expecting to find the most Gentile piece of literature on the planet. I fell off my seat when I read the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I said, I know these guys. <laughs> It's so Jewish. And I suspected, that was the beginning for my walk, of my walk with God because I suspected if I was wrong about the Jewishness of Christianity, maybe I was wrong about the Messiahship of Jesus. Peter doesn't understand yet that God's going to let Gentiles, non-Jews, see the promise of the Messiah was given to Israel. And if you were outside of Israel, you didn't have it. And so Peter and the apostles, though Jesus had just spoken the Great Commission and said, go ye into all the non-Jewish world, they still didn't get it. They were slow to the realization that the Messianic kingdom was being opened to all. So Peter's minding his own business, praying in the city of Joppa on a roof, and suddenly, you remember, a sheet falls down from heaven filled with bacon bits and, and ham hocks, things I used to deliver in Detroit in 1978. Believe it or not, but that's another story. I've told it, but there's many people that didn't believe me. And a voice coming. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you can't even touch those items, but a voice says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. He knows it's the devil. He's wise. Not so, Lord. I know the trap. I have never touched anything unclean. This happened three times, and then the sheet was removed. And while Peter's contemplating, what in the world was that? The Holy Spirit speaks to him audibly and says, I'm sending three men. Shut up and go with them. Don't ask questions. And just as he's hearing that from the Spirit, there's a knock at the door, and the men that Cornelius had sent are at the door, saying, we've inquired of one named Simon the Tanner. Peter invited the men in, told them. They told him who they were, and they tell him the amazing story that Cornelius, a Gentile centurion, a Roman official who's a Gentile but a fear of God, he is... He was praying in his house, and suddenly an angel appeared to him. Peter's listening to this. An angel appeared to a Gentile and told him to send for one named Simon the Tanner, Simon Peter, who's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. And Cornelius sent the men, and Peter, I, I wish I had Polaroids of Peter's face. You got to know how difficult this is for an Orthodox Jewish man. Now he's being told to go with these men and do something highly illegal as a Jew, enter the house of a Gentile. You were never allowed to enter a Gentile's house. It was unclean. You can't do that. Peter never had. Now the Holy Spirit told him to eat bacon bits and then go <laughs> and, and, eat, and go to the house of Cornelius. See, the deal in the first century is different. 
In the first century, it was, have you heard? Gentiles believe. Today, it's, have you heard? Silverberg believes. It's just a different deal. By the way, I have bad news for you. We had it first. Okay. I want to be an equal opportunity offender. Now, Peter's starting to get it, and then they took the three-day journey from Joppa to Caesarea, and there he walks into the house, and the house is packed with Cornelius' relatives and friends and servants. Cornelius falls on his face and says, you know, starts worshiping Peter. Peter says, get up, I'm a man. What, what, what are you doing? Why are you assembled? And Cornelius tells again about the angel appearing to him and telling him to send for Peter. And Peter's first words is, and I'm paraphrasing, now I get it. Now I get it. God is telling me not to call Gentiles common. God is cleansing Gentiles. The messianic kingdom includes Gentiles. So Peter begins to share the gospel. I can't prove this, but I believe under his breath, He's praying to God, please, Lord, let nothing happen. How am I going to explain this to the boys in Jerusalem? But as he's praying, the Holy Spirit fell, and they begin speaking with tongues in the assembly. And all of a sudden, Peter turns to his Jewish compatriots and says, Can we forbid water? These guys got the same gift we did. And that's how Peter knew that the Gentiles were believing in the gospel. They were sealed with the same Holy Spirit the Jewish apostles were on the day of Pentecost. And that's what I want to look at this morning. In these delicious verses that we're going to unpack, I want to look at the work of the Spirit in bringing those called by the Father to become the children of God. How does the Spirit work to make that happen? Now, for the last three weeks, we've been analyzing the first 11 verses of Ephesians 1, and we are still in there. We saw that the entire chapter is a eulogy of God to God. It is all God word. Paul, Peter, I'm sorry, Paul is speaking to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And we saw that not only is it a eulogy, but Paul is blessing the entire Godhead for the fact that that all three persons of the Godhead were responsible for our salvation. These verses sort of serve like a symphony in three parts. In verses 3 through 5, we looked at the Father's glorious plan, which predates creation. That plan takes us back into the eternal counsels of the Godhead. And that plan revolves around a special people whom the Father called in eternity past to be His own. I know there was a moment in time and space when you accepted the gospel, but that's not the beginning of your sojourn in God. It occurred before the world was. In the second part last week, we looked at the Son's great work. The Father had a glorious plan but it was affected through the Son who affected it through His great work. How it is only through Jesus and His redemptive work that these sons and daughters whom God purposed to have in eternity past would actually be redeemed. While the Father proposes to save, the Son executes this salvation through His death and resurrection. In other words, the Son is the sphere in which... Salvation is accomplished. Folks, we were saved by Jesus' death. We are being saved in the present by Jesus' life. And we will be saved along with this entire planet when Jesus comes again and makes all things to be subject to him. And we saw how the Father is uniting all things under one head. One day, you will not be able to look at a blade of grass and not see Jesus reflected in it. He is summing up all things in him. If you don't love Jesus, you're going to be bored with heaven. Because heaven is about Jesus having all things summed up in him 
And then as Corinthians tells us, he will subject himself to the Father and God will be all in all. The final part, which we venture into this morning, of how the triune God saved us has to do with the work of the Spirit. The final part regards the Spirit's incredible application. The Father proposes divine salvation. The Son executes it, but get this, the Spirit actually applies it to our lives. In other words, we're going to answer the question in these verses simply put. How does one who belongs to that chosen company, how does he or she actually come to faith? And the answer, to use a modern vernacular, is simple. The Holy Spirit seals the deal. And that's what I want to look at this morning. Now, first of all, notice the transition in pronouns in these verses. In verses 11 through 12, we saw Pete Paul saying, we have experienced this. And then in verses 13 and 14, he says, you also. And what he's doing here is talking about the first fruit company that came to the Messiah, Jews who came to believe. And then he's saying, you also. And we're really going to focus on that more than the other. But they also, you also, Gentiles, were included in the work of the Spirit. Last week we saw how God describes the spiritual blessings that God has given us through Christ. But this week he adds another paragraph to emphasize that these blessings belong to both Jews and Gentiles. Now I'm going to mess with your eschatology a little today. I promise I will not offend you. You do not have to agree with my eschatology. Eschatology is a study of how things will end up, the last things. And uh, listen, you're free to differ with me. Uh, if you want to have a seat in the far back in the New Jerusalem, that's your prerogative. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Just kidding. I do that to make sure you're awake. But it's important that we understand that God has now affected something by taking Jews and Gentiles and not having Jewish believers and Gentile believers, but he's created from both of those groups a third reality called one new man. And Peter, uh, excuse me, Paul actually anticipates what he's going to say in the second half of chapter 2. We're not going to get there for a couple more weeks, uh, but it, we will get there. So in verses one through, uh, 11 through 12, he speaks of Genti uh, Jewish believers, excuse me, who first believed. He talks of, about them, he says, those we, who were the first to hope in Christ. And you know this. Simply speaking, it was necessary that the gospel first come to Israel and to Jews because the promises of a Messiah who would redeem the Israel were given to one people. If you didn't have a passport that says you were an Israelite, you didn't have the promise. And so, Messiah was presented to Israel. That's the gospel's. And then through the preaching of the apostles, the gospel was presented to Jews. Now, here's the irony of all ironies throughout time. The majority of my people, I'm a Jew. I was born Jewish. And I was born in Philadelphia. I should have been born in Israel. That's another story. But I didn't grow up with the knowledge of the Messiah. And I was an unbeliever, as was my family. God sovereignly saved me. He saved my Jewish mother at 72 years old. You know what she said the night she accepted the Lord? She said, I can't believe I waited 30 years before inquiring as to what changed my son's lives. Wow. But she had five glorious years. My Jewish mother lived in Florida, and she was a rabid evangelist. This is the same woman that when I came to her condo to visit, she would tell me at the door, swear to me you won't talk to anybody. And my brother and I used to torment her and said, Mom, on the elevator ride up, we led your maintenance man to the Lord. He's now putting a track under every door in your condo. And it says Bible study and has your apartment number on it. <laughs> Mom loved that. Now, there's a problem with this story. You, I, I don't think I shocked anybody to tell you that the promise of Messiah came to Jews first. You knew that. But 
wonder of wonders. My people, for the most part, rejected the promise. And today, the majority of Jews are in darkness, still believing Messiah might come, not believing that he has come and he has fulfilled the, the promises he made to the Father. So it would seem, folks, that the promise has failed. God said, I will send Messiah to Israel. He will redeem Israel. Folks, it failed because the majority of Israel disbelieves today and has through the last 2,000 years. You can't have a promise that the Messiah would redeem his people and then have the majority of the people reject him. How does Paul resolve that? It's not our aim this morning, but the answer is called Romans 9 through 11. Read it sometimes. He will tell you he does it by saying not all physical descendants of Israel belong to the true Israel. That's how he resolves it. Now, we've got to get this right. And God would take a remnant, according to Romans 9, 10, 11, a remnant. Praise God, I'm a Jew who is in that remnant. And he said, I will take a remnant of Jews who will believe and the rest will be blinded and hardened. And then I will add to that group Gentiles who believe and there will be many of them and they together will form the Israel of God. The church. Now when we first read these words that Paul writes to Jewish believers, we think we understand them until we realize something. We read them, in him you have obtained an inheritance, etc., and so on. And it seems to be talking about our inheritance that we get, and the verse does, the end verse 14 will talk about that. But verse 11 would read, uh, lead us to believe that this verse is talking about the inheritance awaiting us. But listen to this translation. It is much truer to the text. It's the New English translation. In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession. Most scholars believe that the emphasis here is not on what we get, our inheritance that we get, but God's inheritance that he gets in his people. We belong to God. We are what God inherits. And that is unbelievable. Because if you think about it, it should immediately come to mind a number of verses spoken in the Old Testament of physical Israel. Listen to this. Uh, in Deuteronomy 32, 9, the song of Moses, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. How about this? Psalm 33. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And how about Deuteronomy 4.20? But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own possession, a people, rather, for his inheritance as you are this day. How about Psalm 135? For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, as Israel, as his own possession. Here's my favorite. God comes to a million Jews on Mount Sinai. And he says, you've seen what I've done to the Egyptians, how I bore you, bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine. My treasured possession. I love that. All of these verses make it clear that Israel... The Lord's people are his heritage, what he gets. I, 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 I don't want to shock you too much on a Sunday morning. You're all looking so nice this morning. But it's not so much about what we get. It is what God gets in us. Rick Warren's book, you know, Purpose Driven Life, first sentence, it's not about you. Duh. Duh. But what's amazing about these verses 
is Paul is applying them to Jewish believers, not just to Israel in general. He's talking to Jewish believers. Paul is teaching that this heritage, which he receives and other Jews receive, is not the natural earthly people, but Jews who believe the promise. That's clear in Romans 9, 10 to 11, but we're not going to be able to go there. Now, Paul immediately answers two questions that he knows the readers might have, and I want to gently smite you with them and then move quickly to our final section that will deal with the sealing of the Spirit. We won't be on it long, but it's delicious. Number one, how did we become the people of God, these Jews? Number two, why are we the people of God? And as far as how, here's all that Paul says. Please, please, don't get mad at me. I'm reading the Bible. How did we become the people of God? Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. To quote John Stott, we become the people of God neither by chance or choice. Now, this doesn't mean we are inactive. We have to believe the gospel, and we do hear it and believe it. But we are told here that we simply became the people of God because God willed it. This whole chapter is full of references to God's will, God's pleasure, God's purpose, God's plan. Maybe the better question is why? Why did we become the people of God? Paul answers. I love this. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Earlier, you remember, he said, to the praise of his glorious grace. That's a beautiful statement. It needs unpacking. You know what the glory of God is? It's ultimately the revelation of who God is. You know what the glory of his grace is? It's the self-disclosure of God as a gracious God. Some of us in this very room this morning struggle living the Christian life because we do not really grasp how gracious our Father is because of the Son. We continue to think that God is an ogre ready to destroy us for the slightest infraction brooding over us with evil design. He's a hard taskmaster, but the father is portrayed in the Bible in the person of a father who let his uh, wayward son take his inheritance and go off. And when the son comes back and says, beat me up, father, I have done badly, I have done poorly, the father says, let's party. Now, how did the Gentiles get in to end this morning? You tolerated the first part. Thank you for that. Now you want to know, how did you get in this deal? Well, you weren't inactive. Paul speaks of hearing the word of truth truth and believing. People have this weird relationship to teaching on election, that somehow it's contrary to responsibility. And I love what Spurgeon said. They said, how do you reconcile them? He says, I don't reconcile friends. In our minds, one or the other has to be true. Can I tell you that the paradox of Scripture is they're both true? Get over it. And there's no way my finite mind can congress that we are in the deep end of the theological pool when we come to those matters and they haven't been resolved for 2,000 years. Someone asked me, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? I said, I'm a hyper-Calvinistic Arminian. I had nothing to do with this originally, but now I'm gloriously involved. (laughs) But Pete, Paul says, and this is where I had to make a choice to focus for time's sake on this one statement. He says, you Gentiles were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Having heard the gospel, you believed, 
And the evidence you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How do I know I'm in Christ? I've got the seal. He sealed the deal. Actually, in verses 13 and 14, Paul uses three words for the Holy Spirit in these verses. Promised, he's the promised one. Number two, seal. And number three, guarantee. First of all, he's called the promised Holy Spirit. I went over in my mind, I didn't bring any because I knew I wouldn't have time, but I went over in my mind how many passages in the Old Testament promised that Israel would be redeemed by the outpouring of the Spirit. And folks, it happened 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, the promise. That promise in the Old Testament is updated by Jesus in the upper room. He called it the promise of the Father. And that promise was fulfilled when the Spirit came to the Israel of God. Secondly, there's three, so hold on, we're almost done. He's called the seal. I love that. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed. Sovereign election is taught in that verse. God chose those whom he was going to redeem. So is responsibility. But you having heard the gospel, believe. By the way, that my theology gives power to evangelism because I know God's in the saving business. But listen, when you believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If you read your New Testament, you should stop right here and go, I have heard of that. Where have I heard of that? Let me help you out why I can after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads, and I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, it really bothers me that people are focused on the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast. How come we don't talk about the seal of the Father? And this group has the name of the Father written on their foreheads. We don't, we're not into that. That's boring. Well, let's talk about the mark. Are you going to take it? Someone said probably because I hate lines. I'm just reporting what I heard. Now, why, why does he call it a seal? There are three things that a seal portrayed in the New Testament times. Number one, a, get this, this is powerful. A seal confirmed that a document was true. How many know uh, on our currency is the seal of the United States affirming that these documents are accurate? Number two, a seal was used to mark property, saying if it's marked, uh, it's owned. Whoever owns the seal owns the property. And number three, the seal is used to make something secure. The tomb of Christ at the, uh, had the Sanhedrin seal on it securing the tomb. And when we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, he affirms that this book is true. He affirms that I no longer belong to myself. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And then he seals me and says, this is the proof that I will preserve you and take you to glory forever. And then Paul adds an addendum. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the 
guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The guarantee. Well, you know that word. You just don't know that you know it. It's really the Greek word translated deposit or down payment or pledge. Right? Most of us who bought a house had to put a down payment on. You didn't come with all the cash. I, I wish I did, but I, I put something down, and that was the beginning. I, I don't own it yet, but the down payment says technically it's mine. And Paul says the seal, the Holy Spirit, is the down payment. You get that portion up front because it guarantees the rest is coming. Man, if this is just the down payment, can you imagine what the whole deal is going to be? But I found something fascinating that I had known and forgotten and someone mentioned it to me. The Greek word for guarantee here is Arabon, A-R-R-A-B-O-N. It's the modern Greek word today for engagement ring. So when the Holy Spirit comes and seals me in Christ, you know what's happening. The Father is taking an engagement ring, putting it on my finger and yours and yours and all those who are the redeemed, saying this is my pledge that we're married and one day I'm coming back for you and I'm going to take you to a glorious feast. And at that feast, you'll find out that you have inherited the whole thing. But let me slip the ring on your finger. I love you. You're mine. I pledge to you that you will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He doesn't slip it on your finger and say, now if you don't do this, 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 and I'll take it back. It's there. You're his. And one day, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we'll get to see his face.